Just ignore that guy up there. Everybody look at the bald guy. Laugh at him. All right. Uh, for everybody out in the vendor area, quit talking to my sponsors. No, don't do that. Please keep talking to the sponsors. Um, but get in here for the keynote. All right. Thanks, everybody, for making it out to HughesetCon 6.0. Woo! So real quick, who's been here before? Raise your hands. That's a good. Who's not been here? First time? First time? All right. We're getting more people. That's good. Uh, so my name is Michael Farnham. I am one of the organizers of this event. Um, we got a couple of guys. Sam Van Ryder all the way in the back. He's raising his hand. Uh, David Nestor is somewhere, and he likes being in the background, so that's fine. Um, Clint Bodudgeon, he is our AV guy. And Mr. Adrian over there has got, uh, he's doing all the recording and everything. This should come out very quickly. If y'all know irongeek.com, go out there and all these videos will be there. There's a whole bunch of other good stuff out there too. And thank you for uh, Trusted Sec for uh, letting him come out. If y'all saw Dave Kennedy last year, he's the, uh, he founded Trusted Sec and that's who Adrian works for. So thank you, Adrian. Okay, a uh, few announcements before we get started, before I get Mike up here. So one, if you are looking for a job or if you need somebody to hire, we are starting a job board. You can find it out, and Sam knows where it is, but out where the uh, CTF is happening, the Capture the Flag and the Lockpick Village and all that, there's a job board out there. Don't write too big because then we'll lose it. But uh, there's, a, there's a job board out there. You can post stuff if you want. So just in case you're looking for anything, we can put that out there. Um, I want to thank my top sponsors, uh, Luminate, Optiv, Checkpoint, and HPE, now HP Enterprise, Fortify, but now that we've split, or, sorry, I, I work there, so just letting you know. Um, so those are our top sponsors. Please go visit them. They, they, they make this possible. They allow the price of the tickets to be low so we can get everybody in here. Uh, so I really appreciate if you go talk to them. That would help. You should all get in your bags a passport, a little square with all of the uh, logos on it. Go visit all those booths. You have to have that turned in. Make sure you put your name on it. If we don't know who you are, it's like school all over again. I don't know if it's your homework or not. So uh, make sure you put your name on it. When you get it all completely filled in, take it to the registration desk. And then at 6 o'clock tonight, after everything is said and done, we'll do the drawings. And we've got all kinds of cool prizes. You can see them out there on the booths and everything like that. So make sure you get that done. I do, if you don't know about the Capture the Flag in Lockpick Village, if you're interested in playing today, we've got that over in the corner over there. Um, go play with some locks. Have a good time. If Mike starts boring you, you can <laughs> go over there. Um, oh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> um, I think that's it for announcements. My other guys are gone, so if something does happen. Oh, and uh, thanks to Hotel Derek for the really cool LEDs on the trusses. That was a pretty cool touch this year. So, Mike Rothman. Um, I count Mike Rothman as a close personal friend. Known Mike for a long time. I uh, finally got him down here to speak. So, I uh, really appreciate you coming down, Mike. Um, so, Mike is a... I don't even need to read your bio. I know who you are. He's uh, an analyst. He started his own firm a while back, so, um, yeah, Security Insight. He's been around for a long time, knows the industry extremely, extremely well. Um, I got to know him from the blogging crowd a while back, and he had some great insights. Then he joined up with uh, Securosis, which is a uh, rich uh, mogul, an ex-Gartner guy and all that. So uh, they, they do a lot of really good stuff. So go visit their site, um, wonderful stuff that they do out there. Um, so, I mean, I'm just going to let you come up and start talking. So everybody give Mike a hand. Thank you. 
So Michael uh, wasn't kidding. What's that? You smell good. I smell good. Well, that's that's a win, I guess. Because the because the alternative is not so good, right? Um, uh, so Michael wasn't kidding. I, I, we've actually been talking about me coming down to speak to HUSECCON uh, for the last three years, and due to some you know kind of wacky schedule variances, uh, this was really the first time I could do it. So I, I really am excited uh, to be here. I really am very impressed with the whole community. We met a bunch of the uh, speakers last night uh, at dinner. Uh, just seeing the energy here. Uh, in the crowd and, and just, you know, kind of force security is, is pretty exciting for me because uh, I'm, you know, basically an old guy and I've been doing it before security was cool. Uh, so now the fact that, you know, you're all here because security is cool now either means you've jumped on the bandwagon, so congratulations, uh, you're bandwagon jumpers, or you've been in this space for a long time and you're passionate about it. But at, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because you're here and that's the important thing. So w what I'm going to do today is not do your typical technical pitch, right? I'm up in front of a crowd, you know, usually in some way, shape, or form a couple of times a week, um, and I'm you know, kind of over the whole technical thing. There's a lot of technical sessions today. Uh, they're going to be fantastic. These people will teach you a lot more than I can, uh, but there's something that, you know, a lot of the speakers today don't have, uh, and that's a full head of gray hair. <laughs> right? And, and that usually means they're either prematurely gray, which kind of happened to me, uh, or old, which actually kind of happened to me uh, as well. So what I'm going to do today is really try to relate a lot of what I've learned about just like living uh, to security. Right? Because I think that's an interesting way to relay a couple of messages uh, that I think are important in terms of, of how we need to live. Right. So first, a little bit about me. So hard to see that picture there, but what I'm doing is that this was at my 25th college reunion uh, last summer. 25. It's like a surreal thing to actually say out loud. Right. 25 years since I graduated from college. But what I'm doing there is double fisting, dark beer, dessert wine. I've got a handful of Twizzlers um, right there, and I'm wearing glow sticks. That's pretty much all you need to know about me, right? That, that's all it is. If, if there's a party, I'm there, um, and I never seem to have grown out of that, by the way, which is not good for your liver. So, you, you know, over, over time, at some point, you got to moderate, but I haven't figured that out yet. Um, so in terms of where I've been, uh, there's a whole potpourri of things. So let me just give you a little feel for kind of my career trajectory. So I started at Metagroup, which is a research shop, uh, a long time ago. Uh, I resigned from there. I started a technology company called Shim. Uh, we shut that one down. Uh, then I joined a security services firm called TrueSecure. Um, yeah, I got fired. Um, then I moved down uh, to Atlanta to go uh, and work at CyberTrust. Yeah, I got fired from there too. Um, you know, then I actually, that's when I first met Michael, uh, was when I had my own research shop uh, called Security Insight, which was great fun. I was doing tremendously well. It was great. So, uh, of course, I shut that down. Uh, in order to take a job with another small company called EIQ Networks, uh, oh yeah, and then I got fired from there too. Um, so, <laughs> let's just say I've had a long and industrious career trajectory, which usually involves the CEO coming to me and saying, hey, Mike, we really want to pay you to not come to work for a couple of months, <laughs> right? And I'm like, got it. Honey, we're going on vacation, right? Or whatever it is that we do. But, you know, for the last six years, I've been affiliated with uh, an independent research shop called uh, Securosis. Uh, and what you need to know about Securosis is basically this. Uh, we put the pontiff in pontification, right? Oh, and by the way, what analysts also do is we spend a ton of time on the meme generator because we can, right? While you guys are out like fighting bad guys and doing work and you, you know, I'm sitting there in Starbucks somewhere with a huge ass venti, actually it's a grande in a venti cup because I filled the rest of it with Baileys. Back to <laughs> this one, right? Yeah, 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 that's, that's my life here guys. So now I'll just build this one up. Here again, fired, fired, yeah, I don't know that, okay. So pontiff and pontification. So I've written things, so back in 2007, I wrote a book called The Pragmatic CSO, uh, self-published it, uh, and again, you know, what this was is really kind of a methodology for how to play the game of security. And most people don't understand, you, you know, oh, I do security, I, I, I fight the bad guys, I do that. No, no, it's a game like any other job you have. So this is really a methodology for how you play the game. Uh, I've screwed things up. Right? A lot. And that was funny. I was talking to my dear friend Wendy, and it was just like, you know, after 25 years of doing this, 
you know, you've learned a lot, right? You, unless, you know, you're kind of not the sharpest tool in the shed. You know, you keep screwing the same things up. You go, wow, maybe I shouldn't do that anymore. So I've, I've accumulated a, a ton of road rash through the, through the year, right? And, and again, that's part of the experience. We can, you know, resist the fact that we are going to learn things through pain, or we can go, wow, that hurt. Maybe I don't want to do that again, right? It's like, you know, how many of you folks have kids? Yeah? So, you know, your kids and they, they hit the stove the first time and they're like, ah! You're like, the stove is hot, don't touch it. So what happens two days later? Ah! You, you know, and then, I don't know, maybe by the fifth or sixth time they go, oh, when you said the stove was hot, the stove is kind of hot, right? Well, that's kind of been my whole career, right? You, you know, the stove is hot and then six times later it's like, maybe you shouldn't work with people. And that's kind of how I got to, uh, to Securosis. <laughs> Um, so I'm getting older, and this is actually, you know, kind of interesting. It's not just the gray hair. It's not, you know, kind of um, anything else uh, from that standpoint. No, no blue pills in the audience. Don't have to worry about that, thankfully. Yeah, can I have a hand for that? No? No? Too much information already? First thing in the morning, too much information? Uh, but no, so I was at the uh, Amazon reInvent conference last week, and, and this is a big show, right? 20,000 people, the rooms are big, seven, 800 people uh, in there, uh, and what, what's interesting is what I really found out is I can't see anything anymore. Right, so I'd be sitting in the back of the room because security people sit in the back of the room, right? We're kind of a little socially awkward. We don't really want to be around people. So, you know, we sit in the back of the room and I'm looking at the slides going, holy crap, I'm old. I can't see anymore, right? So then I had to move up to the front, but that was uncomfortable for me. So I had the choice. Do I actually sit, you know, where I could see and be uncomfortable or do I sit in the back and have no idea what the hell's going on? What do you think I chose? Sit in the back, of course, right? I, at the end of the day, I'm a security guy. At the end of the, so, so, yeah, but it, again, it's funny, you know, you're getting older. Um, and, you know, I'm also starting to think about, you know, kind of the journey of life and why. Well, because my kids are starting to get old enough where I actually have to start having conversations with them about things like life and, and people. And, and I have boys and girls, so boys and girls, right? And, and interfacing with like teachers and, and finding goals and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, basically, uh, while, while I'm getting all nostalgic, of course, the success kid is sitting in a pile of his own poo. Um, and I told you, I spent a lot of time on the meme generator, and it is just an awesome uh, existence. But, you, you know, really, that's the case, right? You, you know, we get caught up in our own stuff. You know, sometimes we spend some time, in some cases, too much time looking backwards, uh, but there's always stuff, there's always crap, in effect, that's accumulating when we're not paying attention to it. So, everything changes. Uh, by the way, except fruitcake. Any fruitcake fans? We're getting into the holiday season, yeah? Uh, what? Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I grew up a Jewish guy, right? So the whole fruitcake thing perplexes me to begin with. Um, but, you know, it just seems like that's the one thing in the world that, that doesn't change, right? Fruitcake's pretty much fruitcake. Um, everything else in your life changes. And it's really hard to see that at the time. But, you know, what I've learned in doing this for a long, long time uh, is that, you know, we, we kind of deal with what are seven to nine year cycles. Everybody's familiar with the seven year itch. Well, there's actually, you know, kind of a lot of science behind the fact to say that we do change as individuals, we do change as people uh, every seven to nine years. So it's really an interesting way to kind of look back. 25 years later, I've been through three of these cycles to say, wow, that's actually pretty interesting, right? You know, I was, there was first phase, second phase, third phase, I'm in the middle of four fourth phase now, I hope to get to fifth phase. Uh, and then, by the way, sixth phase is me sitting on a beach somewhere drinking something fruity out of a pineapple. That's my evil plan. We'll see if I can get there. But, you know, we really have to start thinking about how do we change, how do we grow, how do we evolve, right? Um, and then I'm thinking, well, I got to do this keynote at, at HUSECCon, so I really should come up with something interesting to talk about. It's like, wow, you know, I've learned all these things about life. I've been through my whole midlife thing. I've done, you know, kind of a lot of different things. So there's got to be something that I can relate to the crowd, right? And what do these people do? Well, like the picture shows, you basically bang your head against the wall all day long, right? And we were talking at, at, at speaker dinner last night about how oh, senior management doesn't understand me and, and, and you, you know, they have no idea what I'm doing and they can't get the budget and, and all of these things that perplex security folks for the most part. So I'm like, okay, there's obviously a lot of stuff that, you know, I have learned in doing security for 20 plus years um, that I can basically teach you guys or tell you guys or, you know, give you guys some place where you can sit down and drink your coffee uh, while some dude from New York is basically screaming at you. Your choice. 
So what is the first big thing that I have learned about life through security? Well, basically it's, uh, you know, shit happens, right? And, and, and that's exactly the case. I mean, you, you know, no matter what, what it is that we happen and, and, you know, stuff is going to happen, right? Somebody's going to click on the wrong thing. You, you know, you're going to get hit by some kind of malware and that's just in the day job, right? Life is going to happen too. People are going to get sick. You know, you're going to have stuff that may happen in the wrong direction. You may have financial uncertainty. It happens, right? And the point and what we can learn from this is that response matters, right? It's not the fact that these things are going to happen to us. It happens to everyone, right? Nobody, does anybody have like this perfect, you know, Pollyanna life? You live in your Stepford, you know, wives neighborhood, you know, you have your 2.2 kids and your white picket fence and, and, you know, maybe your dog. Uh, no? Would you admit it if you would to get scorned by the rest of the crowd who are not like that? Yeah, good. Just wanted to be clear about that. But I, I don't really know anybody like that. I mean, everybody has their own stuff that they have to deal with. Uh, it's not that the stuff happens. It's how you respond. So another analogy from life is how many times do we see what seems to be a pretty minor thing, deflate gate, um, that becomes, a, a, you know, a huge thing because they're trying to cover it up. Right? You know, it's the response that matters, not the fact that you screw stuff up, not the fact that you make mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're not doing enough. It's not that you make mistakes. It's how you handle those things that go maybe not as you plan, right? Are you reacting or responding? And it's funny, back in 2006, 2007, when I started building a bunch of my research philosophy for security, I had this concept called react faster which to me at the time made a lot of sense, right? I was in my mid-30s, I was running around like a crazy man, I was reacting to everything. But they call it incident response for kind of a reason that I didn't figure out until I was about 10 years later. Because reacting is setting your hair on fire and running around and hoping that things happen, right? Response is a considered approach to dealing with your issue. So again, response matters. Try not to react to everything. Figure out how you're going to respond to things. That's a very important thing that I learned. Right? Don't play the blame game. Anybody know who that guy is? Anyone? That's Kevin Mandia. Maybe you heard of him? I, oh, yeah, so you couldn't tell if he didn't have his big boofy hair. So Kevin Mandia started Mandian. He's been, on, he's been on TV a number of times, basically blaming China for everything. So I just like this one, right? It was China. What's the question again? Um, because it doesn't matter, you know. What every major attack is, China's behind every major attack. That's just uh, the way it works. But again, these are things that we can take from security into life because it's very convenient to blame someone else for our issues. Right? Oh, senior manager doesn't understand me. I can't get the funding. The attackers are better than me. My users are idiots. Uh, my kids uh, won't study. Um, you know, th this one isn't very good. Maybe they should go into technology. Uh, you know, there, it could be anything, right? Oh, did I say that out loud? Oh, that's, sorry. That was, that was my inside voice there that came out a little bit. Um, but, you know, again, it's easy to blame folks for the issues in our life, right? Not going to be helpful, right? Not going to be helpful. Except that you can't prevent everything. And this is something that a lot of security folks, especially young people first getting into the business, they really want to try to prevent everything. Yet, yeah, not happening, right? There's always someone better than you with more money, with more time. And, and that's just the fact of the matter, right? Humans will make mistakes because, um, I actually, I work for a, a group of three guys. So my attack surface is reasonably um, restricted, right? If you work for maybe one or two guys, then yours probably is too. But maybe not. I don't know the one or two folks that work, work with you. You know, I'm, I'm actually the security risk in, on my team, but you know, that's a different issue. Um, but if you work in an organization of, I say more than a dozen, right? And upwards of a couple thousand, you've got no shot, right? Because it's just math at that point. Somebody is going to do something stupid on any given day and you are going to have to clean it up. Welcome to your world. Uh, right? So the only option is we have to plan for failure. And that's something that Werner Vogels, um, he's the, uh, I saw his keynote last year and I couldn't understand a word he was saying. He's got this very thick German accent. He's the CTO of Amazon Web Services. Uh, and that's actually one of his concepts, which is you have to plan for failure. And that's a whole construct of agile development, you know, DevOps. I mean, all these new ways we're building and delivering technology are all based upon this idea that we're going to plan for failure. So again, same thing applies to life, right? We can't prevent everything. We, yes, we can do our diligence. I'm a scenario go guy, right? So I've worked through 15 to 20 different scenarios for everything. Keeps my brain occupied as opposed to doing, you know, kind of maybe things that aren't as uh, productive. But I've gone through all the scenarios, sometimes productive, other times not so productive. I've done my best 
And you know what? There's always the 21st or the 22nd scenario that comes up and happens. Right? You can't control those things. So if you try, you'll make yourself crazy. Uh, buyer beware, right? If it sounds too good to be true, it is. And I love this Futurama guy, right? Um, you know, the product stops zero day attacks with no false positives. Anybody ever hear that? Some vendor comes in and talks about, you know, their latest shiny widget that, you know, has space alien technology and you'll never have a false positive and you don't have to deal with any attackers and you can play Tetris all day long. A anybody remember Tetris? I, I, yeah, thank you. Old people. All right. Thank God. These kids in there gears of war. I don't understand that. Like, Wait, so you get a big gun and you shoot everybody? Yeah, Dad, it's so much fun. Uh, okay. Um, and not that. I mean, listen, if you're into that, I'm, I'm good with that. I don't, don't judge, but, you know, not for me. But, you, you know, the, the point is, um, you, you, you know, you're going to get folks to come in and tell you that they can solve all of your problems with the stroke of a pen of you writing a check to them. And I can tell you after, you know, 20-something years of being in security, it don't work that way. Right. And sorry for anybody out in the hall. It's like, oh, shit, you know, they have their their data sheet that says no false positives and, you know, stop zero day attacks. <laughs> Crap. Burr, you know, right in the in, in the in the waste pail. Uh, but I mean, that's the fact. Right. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. And same thing goes for life. Right. There are going to be people that are going to be selling you all sorts of different snake oil, especially when you go through all sorts of different transitions or, you know, you, you don't like your gray hair, fix your gray hair. You don't like your peg leg. So get a different peg leg. Right. You know, you know, I mean, whatever it is. Right? There's some solution. And the problem is we live in a commercialized society that they will sell and merchandise anything. So the latest thing, and I'll get to this a little bit later on, um, is the merchandise, merchandization of meditation. Right? Now it's a thing, right? You, you, you know, folks have been sitting in a corner quiet for like 2,500 years, but now people will teach you how to meditate. I'll save you a lot of time. Sit in the corner and be quiet for 20 minutes. You've meditated. Okay? Ten bucks. I'm going to come around and, and pass my hat in the audience. So we'll talk about that because that's actually a very important mental practice that I've adopted. But it's really the commercialization of everything that continues to be entertaining, right? So speaking of big budgets that don't equate to security success, I love this one, right? So I'll sit in a room and these folks will go, oh, I have 30 people in my threat intel group. Well, how'd that work for you? Yeah, we got hacked, right? And again, it goes back to the same kind of thing. You can't prevent everything. You can't stop life from happening. Same thing goes here. No matter how much you have, it's not enough, right? And I've gone through this personally, right? That was my 20s. So I talked about the first company we shut down. Well, that was going to be, I called it my plane fund, right? I started a company. I was one of the founders. This was during the internet boom, go-go days. Remember when, when you know, kind of you would have something and you'd accumulate a couple of million eyeballs and they'd say, oh yeah, you're absolutely worth $5 billion. Oh, oh, by the way, we're back there again. I don't know how the hell that happened, but evidently we do not have historians anywhere ever um, because we keep doing the same thing over and over again. But back then I started a company and the idea was I was going to start this company. We we're going to sell it off for a boatload of money. I was going to buy a plane. Right? That was my measure of success. I was going to buy a plane. I have nowhere to go. Right? I have nowhere to go. What do I need a plane for? Right? If I had enough money to buy a plane, I could buy all sorts of first class tickets wherever I wanted to go in the world. But I wanted to have a plane because that was about my ego. So again, it made no difference that I lived in a beautiful house. I had a beautiful family. I had everything. I was very, very comfortable at that point in life. I wanted a plane. Right? That was my striving period. And we all go through it. Whether we're at our job, we wish we had more, we want more defenses, why can't I get funding for that project? Or whether it's life, it's the same thing. Right? There's never enough if you allow yourself to think that way. Right? So one, one of the key things that I've had to learn the hard way is about modesty. Right? It's not modesty, oh, you know, and, and deprecating humor. I do a decent amount of that too. Right. But it's really about living within your means. And, and again, that's what can I do with the budget that I have and the resources that I have, however limited they are or, um, y you know, in life. Right. I, I don't always buy a plane. So this was my, my personal one. Right. The most interesting man in the world. Uh, but it sure impresses my third ex-wife. Right. Because, again, if, if you're striving for everything, you're never going to be happy with yourself. You're never going to be happy with who you're with. And therefore, you're never going to be happy. So, you, you know, if you have, you know, 15 or 20 different alimony payments, uh, then maybe you, you figure it out from that standpoint. So a question that I ask a lot of my friends at given times in their life is how big a boat? Right? And I had this conversation about three weeks ago. A friend of mine runs a lighting uh, company, 
And, and you know, there's nothing better than having friends who don't do technology, right? Because this stuff is, can be all consuming. So the last thing I want to do when I'm sitting watching football game with a bunch of my buddies drinking beers is talk about this attacker or that breach notification. Right? I want to talk about my buddy's light company. I mean, he employs guys that climb on bucket trucks and change light bulbs in parking lots. Right? And they install signs. And it's, it's really a very good business. We think, oh, at least I think, right? I shouldn't uh, project that on you guys. Right? If it's not cool, if it's not insecurity, if it's not all shiny uh, and have a lot of bits behind it, it can't be that interesting. Well, my buddy's actually built a very interesting business installing lights and changing light bulbs. And somebody came and you know, was trying to buy his company. And we had this discussion. He got all wrapped up about, um, he got all wrapped up about the business broker who introduced this person to the, uh, uh, to the opportunity. Oh, they're going to get 25%. They're, oh, you know, and, and we're sitting there churning over 20 minutes into it. And finally, I'm just like, how big a boat? He's like, Mike, what the hell are you talking about? I go, what's the number? He goes, the number's pretty good. I said, what's 75% of that number? Tell me, I, I, that's pretty good too. I go, so how big a damn boat do you need? Right? You live a very modest lifestyle. He's like, crap. Cause he had been wrapped up for three weeks about this 25% he's going to pay to the broker and he forgot the big picture, which is that opportunity gives him financial flexibility for the rest of his life. Right? So again, it's about making sure that you understand what you have. Right? It's not about having all the toys, although if you're into toys, that's great. Right? And again, don't judge that any way, shape, or form. It's about being able to indulge in your passions. Right? It's about being able to sit in Starbucks if you want to and think big thoughts. Maybe it's about volunteering at a local organization that's important to you. It doesn't matter what it is. What it matters is that you're passionate about it. And what financial independence does is it gives you the ability to indulge those things as opposed to working for the man. Not that the man is bad, right? You know, we all have to deal with the man or the woman um, in any way, shape, or form. But, you, you, you know, we do have to deal with those folks. Uh, but, so, speaking of climbing the ladder. So, the good thing is you get to the top, right? And then you realize, holy crap, I got a long way down, right? And, and by the way, this is my life. So I'm not talking anything that I haven't experienced myself, right? EVP of a, you know, high-flying startup when I was 29 years old. Right? VP of a, you know, major research shop when I was 26. I mean, I'd been there. And the only place to go from there is down. Right? And that's just the fact of the matter. So, you know, you spend all your life climbing the ladder and then you look down and one minute you're on top of the world. The next minute you're sitting there packing up your office going, what the hell just happened to me? Right? So what does that mean? Right? Again, this could be security. And by the way, anybody that's in a senior role in security, I hope your resume is updated. Um, and again, it has nothing to do with you, right? It has everything to do with the job, right? The typical lifespan of a senior security professional is anywhere from 12 to 14 months, right? If, and I met, I meet some people who are in the job for eight or nine years and I'm like, what's the matter with you? Right? How can you be that either that good or that invisible that nobody goes, I hate that guy and they have to get rid of you, right? Because that's how it happens in security, right? You know, they're just like, oh, something happened. And even when nothing happens because you're awesome at your job, they're like, something should have happened. It happened to all my buddies. We need to get a new CISO. Um, so that, that, that's a different story, right? So the next minute, not so much. So what we have to learn from that is be kind on the way up, right? And that's the thing. Uh, and I, again, very guilty of this, being abrasive because that was the whole New York persona thing. Oh, he's, you know, oh, he might tell you what he thinks. Well, you, you know, what I've learned after 25 years of this is that you can actually tell somebody what you think and not be an asshole about it, right? <laughs> I, I, again, it, it's just, it, it's these little things that you don't realize until you're like, wow, I wasn't an asshole. And they appreciated what I said as opposed to being an asshole where they're just like, you're right, but you're a total dick, so I don't want to deal with you anymore. <laughs> so again, these are the things that you learn after screwing it up for many, many years uh, in terms of that. So, so be kind, but you know, kindness is one of these words that I think is a little bit loaded, right? So the point is, kind isn't nice. There are some folks that are nice, right? And nice is great. If you're nice, that's awesome. But sometimes you have to have discussions that aren't easy, right? Like this one, right? So, so you see this guy in the picture. And if you know that guy, the nice thing to do is say, wow, you look great. You're growing up. The kind thing to say is, 
God, that sweater is a train wreck, man. You got to burn that thing, right? That's a friggin' tire fire, and you just you, you just need to yeah. You know, I mean, you need to get rid of it because the fact is, they'll actually it maybe be a little sore up front, but they'll thank you because you're being kind, right? You're being authentically you. You're basically saying what you think, but not in a way that breaks them down in a way that helps them grow, right? So then when you have to go to this person, who by the way turns out to be the CFO of your company, then they go, oh man, you helped me with my sweater back in eighth grade, so yeah, whatever you want, man, right? So it's karma, everything everything kind of turns around because you were kind uh, at that point. Right? And then the other thing, don't judge. And, and this is something that I think we're all guilty of in, in all sorts of cases, right? We have a negative interaction with somebody, uh, especially within a work context, but it could be anything. Right? You have no idea what's going on in somebody else's world. No idea. They could have a sick parent. They could have a problem, um, you know, with their mortgage. They could be happy. They could be fooling around on the side. They could be doing a zillion things that you have no idea about. The only thing you see is that they've struck at you or, or lashed out at you because you gave them a bad review or you challenged them in a meeting or, you know, basically you missed carpool one time. You ever do that? You miss carpool, and the other parent is like, you're a fucking idiot! You're like, dude, I missed carpool, really? It's like, I'm 10 minutes late, the kids got there in one piece, it's all good. And then you find out like their whole life is, is cratering in on top of them. So the point is, when you look at things from an open mind and you don't judge folks based upon one specific thing, everything in your life is a lot of By the way, that's hard. Right, because we're trained to judge, and in our society, that's what we do. We look and say, "Oh, this guy's got to be a party guy because he's got like martini glasses on his shirt." But that turns out to be the case. So in that case, judgment, you know, wouldn't wouldn't be that far off. But you know, we can look at everybody, and and you do that, right? You know, you 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 just put up pictures of people, and you'll draw conclusions. You'll build your own stories about what these people are like based upon nothing but what they're doing. See, now I'd look down here and say Trey's wearing a jacket, and it's a conference room. The guy must be from Florida, right? <laughs> totally not. I mean, he grew up in in Missouri, and and you know, right, Missouri. Yeah, Missouri. Hey, how about that? Missouri, you know, where it's pretty cold there most of the time. But evidently, he's cold today because he's wearing this really cool lavender V-neck. And if you show up at his next uh, session next time, you'll get to see Trey's very cool lavender V-neck. But now see, it's now it's a hacker hat. That's right. So you know, again, but I could judge Trey based upon the fact that you know he's wearing a jacket inside, or or the person that wears sunglasses. You know, when it's totally done, you know in, in a club. You ever been that? You know, you've been out in a bar and somebody's wearing sunglasses, and you're just like, hmm. Maybe they're blind. I mean, no joke. Maybe they are. Who knows? Right? But, you know, the point is you've made up a story already about, well, that person is too cool for school because they got their sunglasses in, in the club. By the way, you're probably not wrong because we've been doing this for, you know, decades in terms of seeing what happens, drawing a conclusion about it, and proving or disproving that hypothesis. But, again, I found that to be uh, a path to, um, again, disappointment. Right? So speaking of playing well with others, right? business people care about business not security. Right here, right? Security? Yeah, sure. You know, how many folks have that conversation with their own uh, Bill Lumberg? Um, yeah, I mean, you sit down. What, what senior executive do you sit with to go, oh, security, I don't care about that. Go, go pound sand. I don't give a shit about security. You know, for, just forget it. Right? Nobody does that. So they say, oh, security, oh, security. And then the, the other thing out of their mouth, yeah, can, can you work on, help me work on my tea time? Right? Because, you know, that would be great. And that's what our life is about, right? Trying to get senior management to understand what we're doing. That's what life is about. Right? Trying to understand that people have their own stuff that they're dealing with and they're far more interested in their stuff than they are in your stuff. So with them is a very interesting kind of approach that I've used to get a lot of things throughout my career. Right? And that's just about taking two seconds to think about, well, before I sit across the table from somebody, I better understand what's in it for them. Right? With them is what's in it for me. Because that's what every person you talk to is thinking as you're talking to them. I hear what you're saying, I understand what it is, what's in it for me, right? It's pretty simple, but it means you have to get out of your own stuff long enough to think about and empathize a little bit with whoever you're talking to or whatever it is that you're doing, right? So look out for number one and try not to step in number two, right? That's an old Ron, Ronnie Dangerfieldism that I absolutely love, but that's what everybody does, right? They look out for number one at all times, and the folks that are successful at moving forward in their career in their life understand that and they're able to move forward and they're able to position whatever it is you're trying to position in a way that helps everybody get that win-win, right? And that's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to the point of everybody getting to a win-win. Now, the other thing I've really learned about security and about life that's very important 
is to manage expectations. And this may be a little bit hard to see, uh, but scrawled by that bell, uh, by that doorbell, it says, press bell for immediate-ish assistance, right? Immediate-ish. That is the greatest thing I've seen in a long, long time, right? When I first found that image, I, I fell in love with that image right away because that is exactly what, in my opinion, life is about, right? Managing expectations. They're saying, press the button and we will try to get to it as quickly as we can, which, by the way, may not be that quick. But you can't get pissy because they're telling you it's immediate-ish, right? Maybe it's immediate, maybe it's not immediate, but that's really the point. Right? And that's, a, that's something that we can take into everything that we do. It's about managing expectations, about what you can do, about what you can't do. And in a security role, that's absolutely paramount. Why? Because there's so much we can't do, guys. There's so much that, that is out of our control. And we have to be in a situation where we, where we can have that conversation and sit down with senior management and they'll go, okay, if we invest this much in this project, can you tell me that we're not going to get hacked? Nope. Can you tell me it's going to make a difference? Nope. Can you tell me what would happen if we don't do that? Nope. I can tell you I feel better about the fact that that won't happen, but can I tell you definitively? Nope. Right? And these are tough discussions to have because, you know, people go and, and, and the next person in the CFO's office is the guy that runs the factory and says, if we buy this machine, it results in that much output. And you come in and say, if we buy this machine, I have no friggin' idea what's going to happen. Right? It may not make a rat's ass difference or it may save our bacon. I have no idea and I have no way to know. So trust me. I, I, by, by the way, how does that work for people? Yeah, not so much. Um, so again, so doing security is obviously a lot different than everything else, but it gets back to, um, managing expectations. So speaking of being prepared, uh, you've got to practice, right? So practice safe sex, make love in a Volvo. Uh, no, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about, right? What I'm talking about is practicing. Right? Practicing what we do, practicing our craft. Obviously, incident response is probably the, you know, kind of highest profile thing that we should be going through scenarios, tabletops, uh, actual pen tests, you know, doing things to make sure that when the stuff hits the fan and it will, we're ready. Right? Practice. You don't get good at this stuff by, by, you know, kind of looking at Twitter and saying, you know, oh, you, you, you know, that we, we, we should do that because uh, I, I saw that on Twitter. Not that I love Twitter, right? You know, I'm on Twitter all the time. Uh, but you got to do stuff, right? You got to practice stuff. You have to prepare your people. You got to hack your own folks, social engineering, phishing. I mean, all these things to prepare folks for the real world. When I was an analyst, my first analyst job at Metagroup, we had this thing called the research meeting, right? All the analysts would get in a room and present their you know, basically they're finding for the week. We'd find something and we'd talk about a concept. It would usually be pretty controversial. And you had 70 people who were all very bright, uh, and by the way, all trained to be intellectual gladiators, because that's what that job was, all coming at you, right? And the point wasn't, you know, to kind of put yourself through a gauntlet. The point wasn't, you know, to kind of make yourself feel bad because somebody would rip your position to shreds. The point was, by the time you got done with the research meeting, that position was solid. You knew it was solid. So nobody on the outside was going to be able to touch you. And 10 years later, right, when I got a first set of my corporate jobs, it was actually true. When you work through these things, when you practice, when you get out into the real world, you know, everything goes a lot easier. So you've got to practice. So what does that mean, right? Life sneaks up on you. This was a picture I took, I think, maybe 10 years ago. Um, I was fat. There was no other way to, uh, to talk about that, right? I was big. I, life had sneaked up on me, right? I had infant twins. I had another child. I had just gone through a reload. I had a very challenging job. And what I did, which is what I've done throughout my life, I ate my way through it, right? I, I ate my way through it, right? You know, so it's easy to be consumed by your job, by your life. You have to make time for yourself. Uh, but I had a cancer scare, right? Turned out to be nothing, but you, you know, I, it scared the shit out of me. And, and I weighed 275 pounds. Right? And I'm like, holy crap, I am on the express train to, you know, the end of this life. So I decided I had to make some changes. So everybody gets to their own different catalyst, but you have to have some practices that you adhere to. So what, what do I do now? I, I run, right? And I do yoga. I'm like, oh, Mike, you do yoga? Yeah, I'm actually, it's funny. I have girls who are dancers and I'm a lot more flexible than them and they hate that right, which is the best thing ever. So I'll get down and I'll get into a forward bend or I'll, you know, kind of do some weird position uh, and they'll be like, oh, and I'll go, your dad is a lot more flexible than you. How do, how do you like that, right? How do you like that, high schooler? Um, but 
what I've done is I've prioritized these practices. So as opposed to going out and drinking last night, which I really wanted to do, I got on the treadmill and ran for five, five miles, which by the way sucks, right? I, I just, but it was dark and I don't know this town and you know, there are demons here and that kind of thing. So, um, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, I've, I've seen, I've seen the, the, the movies, right? Um, you, you, you know, so I, I sat on a treadmill and it sucked, but you know, I got my run in. And, and tomorrow I will take time out of my work day and do a lunch yoga class because that's what I have to do, right? That's what I have to do for myself. And that's an investment in myself uh, that I've decided to, to make because I wanted to live. And that was really the decision I made. Right? I had a choice. I could continue to go down the path I was going down and that would result in not living or I could make some changes and maybe give myself a chance to live. By the way, no guarantees. I get that. Um, you know, I travel around a lot. All sorts of things can happen. So there are no assurances. But I knew where I was going and now I know where I am going. And by the way, I don't know where I am going. So, you know, it's even better. Uh, train your brain. So the other aspects, so there's obviously the physical side of that, but there's also the mental side of that. So about Seven, eight years ago, I started meditating. And why was that? Because I was your high, typical high-strung, high-achieving New Yorker who was consuming himself. My thoughts were going everywhere. I would be thinking about everything. I'd run through 50 different scenarios about all the things that can go wrong, and I made myself very unhappy and grumpy. So what I found is that by sitting quiet in a corner, by the way, I don't sit in a corner, I lie in bed and I have a great app. If anybody's interested, come up and ask me after the, uh, uh, the talk. I'll, I'll tell you about the app that I use now to meditate anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20 minutes every morning and it just mellows me out, right? Some people do crack and I, I'm not judging, right? Maybe it's meth, um, you know, to kind of take that edge off, whatever it is. I just, you know, kind of sit in bed and I listen to my app and, uh, and it helps, uh, right? Relieve stress, be mindful. Um, and what it's really done is it's, made me much more aware of the things that I can control and allowed me to accept the things that I can't. And by the way, insecurity, there really isn't a lot that you can control. So it's been a very interesting and important practice for me. Again, I'm not proselytizing or anything. Uh, Jen Manel and I have done, you know, kind of mindful present, mindfulness presentations uh, for security crowds. There are a hundred practices that you can do. It doesn't matter which one. Find the one that works for you. But if you're in this job, if you're in any kind of high stress situation, you want to have some kind of mental practice that's going to allow you to deal with uh, with the stuff that you go through, right? And never stop learning, right? I started this thing, change, growth, evolution. That's all about learning on an ongoing basis. And that's the thing. If there's one thing I can sit there and go, security has taught me about life. It's the fact that this world is always going to change. There's always going to be something you have to know. And if you accept or think that you know everything, you may as well just put a big target on your head and, and get ready for the shot. Right? Because there's always going to be something new. There's always going to be something that you have to continue to learn. You've got to be reading all the time. You've got to be up to date on what's going on. And that keeps you engaged. Right? So my mom moved to Florida about 25 years ago, as most New York Jews would tend to do. Um, you, you know, and I'm in Houston, right? That may not resonate for a lot of you folks. So, okay. So what happens is you have Northeasterners who have too much money, um, and end up getting tired of the cold. So they all move down to Florida. So basically what you have are these huge communities of old people. They play golf, they play uh, mahjong and canasta and all sorts of other card games. Uh, and you know, it, it's a fun lifestyle. But you see the people who are engaged with their life because when you talk to them, there's like a flickering there. You have a conversation and you see that there's somebody home. And then you see the other folks who haven't done anything for 20 years and you're like, what the hell happened to you? Right? Because they stopped learning. They, they decided it was okay to go to, you know, the gym and walk around a little bit or, or play a little bit of golf or, you know, sit there and play cards, but they haven't been improving themselves. So I'm constantly, and not, not that my mother needs a lot of motivation, but she's taking classes, she's doing this kind of thing, she's making new friends, anything to keep the brain moving. Because the minute you stop moving physically, the minute you stop moving mentally, it all goes downhill. So always keep that in mind. Always, uh, Learn, never stop learning, that's critical. So speaking of the mindset of a security person, right? We have to be, because our, our existence is kind of tough, right? And, and the analogy I, I like to use has always been around, hey, you know, you get home and your significant other goes, hey, how was your day today? And you go, my day was great. And they say, what happened? And you go, nothing. Right? What happened today? Nothing happened today. It was an awesome day. For most people, that's like the most boring thing ever. Right? For a security person, if nothing happens, that's the best day. 
Because when something happens in our world, it's usually not good. Right? It's usually not good. So there's this whole thing of needing external validation. Most people like when their boss or somebody else comes and says, hey, you did a nice job on that. Forget it. Right? Just forget it. You work in security. Right? Nobody will come and say, thank you for blocking all of those spam messages. <laughs> By the way, do this. For 10 minutes, turn off your spam filter and see what happens. Your phone will light up like a friggin' Christmas tree. You will be the least popular person in your company for those 10 minutes, right? Nobody says, thanks for blocking all those spam, but they will find you. It's like the bank. Anybody work for a bank here? Yeah, a couple. Um, it's like the bank, right? You never hear from them until you started to go into your, your overdrawn period. Then they'll find you, right? My, my former wife, you know, she, she, you know, basically we had this problem. She basically had this account, totally forgot about, you know, had monthly things. They didn't find her for, I don't know, eight years. Drawn down monthly things. Money runs out. Guess what? It took them three days to find her. <laughs> you owe us $400. What? They'll find you, but only when they want to. Right? So if you need validation in order to feel good about your job, you are in the wrong profession. I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to say that. Right? Because nobody is going to come and pat you on the back because you stopped the attackers. Nobody is going to pat you on the back that you contained the malware that the person who spent or who sells $4 million worth of stuff in your company has clicked on because they're a total deviant. But they sell $4 million worth of stuff, so we deal with the deviant. By the way, the deviant, more often than not, becomes the CEO. So you as a security person, they're going, again, really, Japanese stuff this time? You got to stay out of Asia, right? And that's the only thing you can say, because they're the friggin' CEO. They're the CEO. You can't say, don't do that. They're like, I'm going to do it because I'm the CEO. So, learn to love obscurity. It doesn't last, right? It really doesn't last. They will find you, like they found my former wife on that, right? The victim mentality. And this we have a lot in insecurity, right? It's never our fault. Here's the thing, right? If you won't own your shit, Mr. Burns will buy it from you for 10 cents on the dollar. It's as simple as that. We, you, you know, in a lot of cases, we'll make mistakes, but we will try to find other people because it, it's kind of like a PSTD thing. Right? You know, you're just under fire all the time, then it just becomes, you, you're just shell-shocked. Right? Or, you know, any football players, right? You know, you start hearing, you know, the rush. It's a phantom rush, right? The, the people aren't there, but, you know, you start ducking because you've been hit 50 times during the game. These are the things we have to deal with, right? Is everyone around you an idiot? Do they just not understand? You know what I found out after the third time I got fired? It was me. Right? I was a shitty employee. I have opinions. I share them when I probably shouldn't. I can get very fixed in terms of the way I think things should be. Um, and I do very good for the first year because they brought me in to fix a problem. And then after that, they're always doing the calculation. He's good at this and he's a real pain in the ass. And at some point, you know, the balance shifts and they say, we're going to pay you for a little while not to come to work. And I've accepted that about myself. And, you know, would it be different now that I've kind of gone through a lot of this growth and, and evolution and transformation? I think it would, but I'm probably never going to try. Uh, never is a long time, right? I'm, I don't foresee trying anytime soon because then my road rash comes back, right? It's like, oh, boss telling me what to do. Don't like that. Don't like that at all. And I can sit in Starbucks and not have a boss tell me what to do. So I think I'll, I think I'll do that for a little while, right? Um, if you want peace of mind, accept your own stuff. I want, I want to read this because it's important, right? If you want peace of mind, do not find fault with others. Rather, see your own faults. And this is hard to do, right? This requires introspection. This requires brutal honesty with yourself. And again, you'll get to that at some point. It may be harder. You may be forced to do it. Or you can do it consciously and, and with awareness and figure out what your issues are and then start to work on them, right? Delusion doesn't help. Right, so how many folks, you, you, you know, kind of say, oh, I can take them. Right, so you got that little, and you know what, maybe they can take them because there's all this jujitsu stuff going. Any jujitsu folks out there? Great respect for jujitsu because I've seen very, you know, kind of modestly sized people take down very large people and I'm like, wow, that's impressive. Um, but that's, you know, uh, and then the, the very large person then pulls out a gun and you know what, 
all your jujitsu doesn't really help um, in, in that case. Uh, right, so, so again, there's always somebody bigger, there's always somebody stronger, there's always somebody that can, that can uh, do something else. Um, delusion is, is not going to help, right? You got to see the world for what it is. Right? You, again, you, you know, trying to think that it's something different than what it is is just not going to serve you and it's not going to serve anyone. Um, so again, brutal honesty with yourself first and foremost. Kindness in terms of how you relay that to everybody else. Critical aspects of, again, both security uh, and life, right? So to stay in security, you got to figure out a way to be happy. Because again, if you can't be happy and engaged in what you're doing, you're wasting time. And this is not an easy job, right? It's not a job where, you know, again, you're going to get that external validation. It's not a job where you can really win. Right? You know, sales, you win the deal. Marketing, you generate leads, right? Manufacturing, you build stuff. You know, you optimize things. Security, you try to survive. Right? You, it, it's a great day. I made it through the day. My head's still attached to my body. It's good. It's good. Right? So we have to find other ways for happiness. So this is a, you know, some content I took from a, a presentation I did a couple of years ago when I was first struggling with this. I'm, I've, you know, kind of reached a certain point in my career in my life where most people would say I'm pretty successful. Why do I feel shitty all the time? Right? So that's kind of what drove me to do a lot of these things. So, you know, I came up with a couple of different, you know, kind of ideas that, that helped me. Right? So first is a quote from uh, the late, great Steve Jobs. Right? Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. And this is something that I struggled with for a long time. Right, because culturally where I grew up, you know, kind of what, what kind of family I was in, the opportunities I had, I thought I had to go down a certain path. Right, and it took me a long time to accept the fact that, you know what, my path isn't the path that my mom or my dad may necessarily have chosen for me, uh, and maybe yours isn't what your mom and your dad would have chosen for you. And that's okay, right, because it's your life, it's your path, it's not anybody else's. Uh, don't argue with idiots. Uh, innocent bystanders may not know the difference. Uh, I use that one all the time. Right? Because you'll get into it with folks and you'll just be like, what the hell just happened? And it makes no sense. Right? And then somebody else has no idea who's the dumb one in the crowd. Right? Yeah, but I was right. It doesn't matter. You're arguing with an idiot, so therefore you're both idiots. That's helped me. Uh, enjoy the fleeting moments of happiness. They don't last long. And this is the ephemeral kind of way that life works. Right? Some days you're happy. Other days you're not so happy. It, it, it's all the same. Right? I mean, you know, you just accept it. You know, some days you're just in a grumpy mood and that's okay. Right? Some days you're on top of the world. And by the way, some days you're up, down, up, down, up, down. And that's okay too. Right? But I try to be thankful. I try to be aware when I am genuinely happy. Right? And it'll, it'll happen in strange places. I'm driving back from the airport. I got my iPhone on shuffle and one of my favorite Foo Fighters songs comes up. Any Foo Fighters fans out there? A couple? You see the show? You see the, the tour this time? Dave in his throne. I mean, how awesome was that? Uh, I was in the pit for one of the shows. You know why? Because I can. <laughs> how about that? I was like, oh, I could sit on the lawn or I could get into the pit. Mm, which one am I going to do? Uh, so I sat in the pit. Um, I didn't actually sit. I stood in the pit because it's the pit. You can't really sit in the pit. Look at that. Uh, and I haven't even started drinking yet today. So this is, this is good. Um, so, But, you know, my favorite Foo Fighters song came up and I felt... Joy. I felt happiness. And I was like, wow, I'm happy. It's a beautiful day. I got my sunroof open. I'm listening to my favorite band and my life is pretty okay. And then I got home and my kids started yelling at me about something and some bill came due and the toilet fucking broke. And, you know, I just, I, and now I'm like, fuck, you know, fuck, 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 it, fuck it all. Right. And, and I mean, that's just the way life is. Right. Um, be kind because karma matters. And, and I actually believe this too. Right, so obviously in my business, it's all based upon advising folks and publishing things. Um, and, you know, I'll talk to people and I know they don't have, you know, money or budget or they shouldn't be spending their money or budget on the stuff that I do and I help them anyway. Right, and, and if there's somebody who wants to talk about mindfulness or, or running or, or anything, I, I take time out of my day and, and I tell my stories. And I don't teach unless somebody asks me to teach them, but um, I, I tell my stories and I share my experiences because I like to pay it forward because when I was young, when I was struggling, when I had issues, I had people who did the same thing for me, right? I had people who would take time out of their day and tell me I was screwing something up or make suggestions or help me and open up my mind. So I like to do that for other folks too, because it matters and it does come back to you. I promise you that. Um, love the important people to hell with everyone else. 
Um, and that's a hard one for a lot of folks to get their arms around uh, with in this society because, y- you know, oh, we're supposed to be nice to everybody. You know what? Some folks you don't want to be nice to because they're assholes, right? Don't be nice to assholes. That just, it's like positive reinforcement, right? It encourages them. Exactly. That's exactly right. But the people that you care about, care about them with everything you have, right? That's the important thing about life that I've found. Uh, and the past is gone, let it go. Future hasn't happened yet, so don't worry about it. Just try to stay here, right? Uh, we spend so much time worried about things that are such, you, you know, kind of extraneous use cases. And, and by the way, our job kind of reinforces that need to do that because we got to think about the edge cases that'll get us killed, right? Because that's our job. By the way, that will consume you if you do that in life. You will spend all your time worrying about the 2% cases of likelihood. Right, so what I've come to is it's really a risk-based mentality, right? Which is, I know the likelihood of that happening is 2%, and if it happens, I'm totally screwed. I get it. I'm not going to worry about it because it's 2%. I'm going to worry about the 80% thing, which I feel pretty comfortable with, which allows me to just stay right here talking to you guys right now, not worried about the five things that I have to do when I get on the plane this afternoon. Because I'm having fun doing this, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and one final thought, this is something that my dad sent me uh, when I was going through a very difficult time. Uh, it was from Jerry Seinfeld's book. He wrote this probably 15 years ago, maybe longer, right? Life is truly a ride. We're all strapped in and no one can stop it. As you make each passage from youth to adulthood to maturity, sometimes you put your arms up and scream. Sometimes you just hang on to that bar in front of you. But the ride is the thing. I think the most you can hope for at the end of life is that your hair's messed, you're out of breath, and you didn't throw up. I, I look back at this quote all the time. I read this when, when my daughter had uh, her bat mitzvah a couple of years ago um, to the whole crowd. And, and I, I try to actually live by this, right? Which is, you got to accept the ups, you got to accept the downs. The, the time personally I feel most alive in my life is at the top of a roller coaster. And that's what I do. And I've infected my children with that disease. So we all go to the, to the Six Flags uh, by my house and we ride roller coasters all day, six, seven times. We can't, I mean, we literally, I mean, you know, we're, we're disoriented. I really shouldn't be driving after one of those days, but I, I feel more alive at the top of a roller coaster than anything else, right? And it's that adrenaline. And, and to me, it's about the ride. So you know what? Enjoy the ride. This is the one we got, right? So enjoy the ride. Understand our job is our job, right? Our life is our life. There's stuff that we can learn from our job that we can apply to our life. Uh, to hopefully, you know, just have a, a good experience at the end of the day. Um, this is how you can uh, get in touch with me, right? I'm on the Twitter every so often, Security Insight. Uh, read our blog. We publish a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, most of it is nonsensical, uh, but some of it is actually useful uh, on that front. Uh, and again, I, I am so truly grateful for Michael for uh, inviting me to, to talk, for you guys uh, for listening. Um, and, and with that, uh, I guess we probably have another set of breakouts. We have um, 10 o'clock is the next talk, so y'all go out there and see the vendors for a little bit, and then you should have in your bag to be the agendas, and there's placards in front of those rooms, so whatever you're most interested in. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, guys.